and I'm the director of Illan Westcock Arts Centre, which is located in the town of Skibbereen on the south coast of Ireland. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all here today to this conversation between artist Siobhan MacDonald and curator Ula Tapale on the occasion of Siobhan's exhibition Traces of Air here at Illan. We managed to physically install the exhibition in our galleries before the current lockdown, but unfortunately we haven't been able to open it to the public. However, we have made a video tour of the exhibition and have brought it online for viewers to access in that way. Um, so uh, today's conversation will offer another way to experience Siobhan's work and the exhibition. So on to the introductions. I'll just admit some more people there. So Siobhan MacDonald's practice draws attention to contemporary topics dealing with air, breath and atmospheric phenomena. She weaves scientific knowledge into her art in a poetic and thoughtful manner. She is currently artist in residence at the School of Natural Sciences in Trinity College Dublin and she is working with world leading research facilities such as the European Space Agency and the JRC European Commission to explore ecological concerns. And Siobhan was selected as the 2020 Climate World Artist in Residence. Uh, Ula Tapali is a Finnish curator and researcher. She is especially interested in enhancing cultural and ecological biodiversity through art and science interventions and educational projects, and in building bridges between art and science communities, and in facilitating dialogue between artists, cur creators, scientists and the general public. Currently, she works at INR, that's the Institute for Atmospheric and Earth System Research at the University of Helsinki, and also with other international programmes and initiatives combining arts and natural sciences. She curates and coordinates the Climate World Arts programme. So, uh, Siobhan, do you want to say a few words or will I go straight into the, the video? Um, I'll just say, um, I just would like to say uh, a huge thanks to Eleanor for facilitating the show and for making it happen during the lockdown. And um, also to Ula um, for participating in this conversation. We met a couple of years ago, auspiciously in Italy. And this, and Anne to you as well. Thanks so much for um, everything you've done in the last while. And uh, so I'm, I'm really delighted to be here and to share the work with everybody today. Okay, thanks Siobhan. So we're going to start by um, just showing a short clip of the video um, tour that we made of the physical exhibition in the galleries at Illan.
we here now? Yes, I okay. think we are here. Um, and hello, uh, everybody from my, my so thank you very much for Anne and Sipon to for inviting me to this conversation around uh, Sipon's exhibition in, in, uh, in the gallery. I must say that this uh, documentation uh, that the gallery Anne and, and the colleagues has made of the exhibition is excellent. Uh, I've been going through all the material that is uh, quite a lot. Uh, it's not only the exhibition that is um, it's in, in, in the gallery space, but it's a lot of also other articles and, and uh, other material of Siphon's uh, earlier works and, and, and shows. And it's, I think it's an excellent work, uh, the documentation, because now we don't have uh, any other <laughs> way to go to the places. And uh, after seeing all this, I feel that I, I was there physically. <laughs> so um, before we could start, um, the Traces of Air is the name of the exhibition. What is the inspiration uh, behind the show? Um, well, the idea for the, the exhibition germinated over a very long period of time. And, uh, ideas of how the earth acts as a res uh, resonant vehicle for frequency biosis between you know humans and the earth plants um, so in this first photograph uh, is a field trip that i took to mount etna many years ago where you can actually physically see the earth as a, a breathing core and a way to kind of you know ex expel breath from the earth literally energy energetic force. So I'm going to just talk through some of the research and weave it into the work as we go along. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> um, this is an artwork that's not on the show, but it is part of a series of work and it's called um, It's a prism and a film made up of uh, volcanic activity all over Europe. And um, it's, it's the idea of using prism and uh, volcanic imagery is when to allude to the to the, um, to the point of how our air and our light changes when uh, particulates in the atmosphere interact with the atmospherics. So, uh, for instance, when a volcano erupts, it um, it emits ash into the air and it changes the light. So. Um, and, and the video that you would have seen in the beginning, this is one of the images. It's um, it's called to breathe, and um, I've used the structure of the human lungs as a way to give a voice to man and nature. Um, and what you see are layered images of the very first um, X-rays of human lungs after the Industrial Revolution. It suffered from pollution right up until today. Uh, imagery as so I layered those images together and overlaid them over opacence over of the plants and um, going back to, to um, the early 1900s. So the sand piece with this uh, um, is very important. It resonates at the frequency of a breath. And I worked with David Strolling, a wonderful composer in Ireland, who uh, worked with me and we did an open call in Trinity College Dublin and we invited people to come and have their breath recorded. And so we also uh, listened to the inside workings of plants through plant sensor technology. And we recorded the plant piece, which is not the sound piece of the work, but the production film. Um, this is another image. And this is, believe it or not, the work installed in the gallery, um, which you can't get to see, unfortunately, but that's uh, how the film acts in the black space. Um, another artwork that uh, relates to the series is called Herbarium of Breath, and it's, it alludes to the themes of you know, deep time and memory, and um, it's, it's the atmospheric particulates in Europe that I collected between the volcanic ash from the summit of the very eruptive volcanoes, the particulates in the air that uh, were collected in the European Commission, they have these antennae that collect air particles, and they posted them to me 
and I made ink out of them. So this, uh, the imagery here reads as a frequency um, of, uh, that relates to the sound frequency that I found inside of the air. So each one of these plates contains either an ancient plant or um, that some of them are gilded in gold to fossils of plants, to um, paintings made from volcanic ash. So it's, it's the um, primal matter of what makes up our air um, across Europe. So particularly now, since you know we're in such a climate emergency and everything is going on um, with pollution, but now, I, I guess, with the property, um, I'm so aware of the air. And, the genesis for this work started um, with my interest in Eastern philosophy and um, notions of um, breath through meditation and the relationship between what you breathe out and what you breathe in and how you can access different layers of consciousness through breath. Um, so the latest work in the show is a series of paintings called um, uh, Three and I made them during the pandemic. They're, uh, they're made on thick uh, pieces of wood, some of them are thick, and they, uh, I, I, I'm very interested in Japanese art making process, particularly print making. So they influenced the form that uh, these artworks took. But they uh, work with some of the drawings that I made of forests and how trees communicate with each other in their underground systems and how the light changed in forest. Um, uh, Siobhan, Siobhan, sorry, your sound is fading a little bit. Maybe if you could sit closer to the mic. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, did you hear any of that? Yes. Okay, okay good. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's easier. And yeah. um, this is another work, it's called Silent Witnessing. And it's uh, it's, a, it's an archive that was never really intended to be made. It's, it alludes to some of the, the marks that are left behind and the residues that are left behind by fossils, but also by light. Um, I won't get into the story of how this was uh, made, but it, uh, it's, if you can see it closely, it's, it's the imprint of butterflies that was left through um, a natural photogram that was made over a hundred years as the light penetrated onto the back paper and dust. And then I worked into it with silver nitrate to make this work. So it's about the idea of, um, I guess, you know, uh, that even if something disappears on the earth, that it leaves its, its residue, it leaves its mark. And um, yeah, okay, so, that's another installation shot of the gallery. This artwork on the right is a map of all the stars as if you were inside the galaxy and you were looking uh, at the stars. And, and some of the star constellations on the map um, relate to Polaris, which is one of the star constellations that the um, early explorers used in order to navigate the Northwest Passage. It's a photograph with pink painting. So, uh, the the nature and, and uh, yeah all all of your work it's very close to the nature and the inspiration seems to come very much from from there. Uh, I'm not so aware of uh, Ireland and how was the lockdown there, but I, I think that it has been one of the more severe in in the whole Europe. Um, I was wondering, have you been able and have you spent more time in the nature and, and for example, with trees uh, during this year than, than before in your life? Or how that, did it affect uh, to, your, to your kind of like a, um, outdoors life, this, this situation? Well, yes, Lila, great question. I, I thought I was. I was thinking of to do forests and beyond my 5k, I have to admit on occasion, I had a sheer desperation because it's quite urban and, and trees and plants became so pivotal for me um, because, uh, because I guess, you know, with the pandemic, we've all been fixed in one place and plants are fixed in one place. So I started to 
uh, realize that, if, you know, as we slow down inside ourselves, the pandemic has been brought us all into state. And, um, and that I could almost, I could kind of really, it came through in my painting where I, I started to uh, think about the underground networks inside, you know, inside the earth. And that's something that really work. Um, these are more paint, this is more of the paintings in the gallery and uh, also this one. So it was also about idea of lost landscapes, which I'll get into um, later in the talk, but the uh, under, under the ground, under the layers of soil, there's all these past worlds that are trapped inside of um, the earth, which, you know, through the effects of climate change have been exposing themselves and um, like secrets from the past. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's your question. <laughs> uh, there, there are some names of the of your works, the paintings, for example. Uh, you you describe that the trees are murmuring or to one to another or whispering trees, and so. Um, how do you communicate with the trees yourself? Yeah. Um, well, for me, one of the greatest joys is a walking in a forest um, uh, because I almost give up any attempt to analyze and, I, you know, I can almost hear it breathing. Um, and uh, this first artwork I want to show you is a, is a good example to try and explain how I communicate with trees or how they come into my work. It's, uh, it's Trinity College Dublin and during the drought in uh, two summers ago, this extraordinary drought that went on a lot of the plants and trees um, were really suffering and there wasn't enough water and there was scorch marks in the grass which is exposing again a lot of um, a lot of past worlds this set of trees were very close to my studio at the time in Trinity and uh, what they're they're the oldest symbol really of, of they're 200 years old Oregon maples and um, very sadly during the drought one of them actually fell down because it just didn't have enough water. But the other tree, which is called a sister tree, was they were called sisters trees, came down because their roots were attached. And it, they, you know, um, we we talked a lot in the botany department of the fact that it had come down in sympathy, you know. But the the um the, these trees reminded me of the lungs of Trinity because of where they're situated in the topography of. Um, Trinity with inside the heart of Dublin. So um, as another work I want to show you now um, that that answers the question a little bit more uh, deeply and relates it more to Irish historical um, events about how Irish people communicated with trees. And this image is an artwork that um, I made a couple of years ago in response to the Black Pig Dyke, which is a commission that I worked on with Creative Ireland and Monaghan County Council. And the Black Pig Dyke is a linear earthwork that's Bronze Age and it goes right across Ireland in a very, very thin line, almost in the north. It starts on one side and goes to the other. And it's a series of underground monuments um, that stops and starts because some of them have been obliterated. Um, the most interesting part of the project is the fact that in 100 AD, Ireland was going through a similar climate crisis that we're going through now. Ireland, um, it was like there was a climate uh, crisis that meant that, you know, people were starving, there wasn't enough food. And um, Irish people at the time believed that the sun was God. So there was uh, on this line of linear earthwork, it is a very, very long post that went across the whole of Ireland. It's very hard to explain, but, and it was made from oak trees. And in a ritual, the Irish people um, burnt this fence and you can imagine a wall of fire and how hard it would be to burn oak, um, but they managed to do it. And I worked with the archeologists, um, Colleen O'Driscoll, one in particular, and we were looking at the, the latest radiocarbon dating of, of the, some of the material that came out of the, the, um, 
the archaeological monument. And it was absolutely fascinating because the, uh, the trees <clears throat> um, that burnt left a line inside the earth in, in the soil, which was a beautiful scorched red mark. And it's a parabolic technique where the trees actually charcoaled from the lack of oxygen. Um, I made this work, this is in Limerick City Gallery, in relation to trees and how Irish people communicated with trees and fall in order to leave a response or to respond to the current climate ch change that they had at the time. And it was almost like a cry or prayer to the God of Sun. Um, so this piece is in, um, in Traces of Air. And these are the actual, this is a smaller circle, and these are the actual particles of charcoal that came out of the dig um, when I worked the archaeologists. And um, I've made it into a circular form because it relates to a lot of the stone monuments in Ireland. But these, this is the, the actual material matter that came from those trees and from that ritual. Um, hey, somebody was asking you the name of the artwork. I don't know. I think she was referring to the earlier one the, with the fire. Uh, am I right? Pardon? Uh, somebody, oh, so yeah, somebody was asking you the name of the artwork that you were talking earlier, the, the one with the fire. Um, that was a photograph that it was made. Yeah. yeah, I thought so. With the fire, yeah, but that yeah. wasn't. Yeah. Um, there is this untitled, that piece is untitled. But the circle in the gallery is called What Remains. And um, if, if in case that helps. So it's about what is left in the landscape. But the first piece is untitled. Um, this painting um, is part of that project also because it's, it's made on um, copper, bronze, uh, with gold leaf um, and oil paint. And, I was playing with the idea of signaling because I felt that the Irish people were signaling to the sun um, and sending out a message. And uh, when you look, when, the, when you're in the presence of this painting, it actually, ha it can, if there is a particular light, if the light is shining on it, it's, it sort of beams itself. So I, I was playing with ideas of, you know, time machines and portals of time, because in Ireland, um, around that time, the, a lot of the scorch marks in the earth, um, this is two summers ago, and a, around Europe, a lot of monuments were coming up out of the ground and exposing themselves, Neolithic monuments that um, very often people didn't even know existed. So it's about these signals coming back and it begs the question, if that's what um, our ancestors were leaving in the landscape um, for future generations, what, what are we leaving in our landscape now? Um, you know, what, what have we left inside the land of our layer of time? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there is this very um, site specific, um, I mean, the, the places and the sites are, are very important to starting points for, for, for your yeah. work. Uh, narratives and, and old history uh, and the stories from the history. I, I wanted to mention now also that, um, as Anne said, I, I'm a curator in a climate rural arts program that is uh, actually in the University of Helsinki in a forest repeal station in the middle of uh, boreal forest in Finland. And uh, Sifon was um, selected among 168 artists uh, almost two years well those are 2019 in the in the end of the year to be uh, artist in residency as uh, at, at the station and this station is uh, specific in that sense that um, well it's it's in uh, royal forest and and uh, finland is um, uh, covered by forest in in uh, i mean uh, but this forest is special because there is a, a laboratory um, that University of Helsinki and Einar Institute of Atmospheric and, and Earth System Research, uh, they study the interactions between the atmosphere and, and, and the boreal forest. 
So um, I don't know how much we have to wait still, but <laughs> of course we are very anxious to, to have a siphon to, to work uh, in the station and, and have dialogues with, with, with our scientists and, and see what comes out from, from this, this place. And, and further on with these scientific collaborations, uh, looking at your work and, and the collaborators uh, that you have had in, in the past and in the present, um, there are so many scientific institutions and, and research facilities, as well as scientists that you have worked with. Uh, however, you are educated as a painter and uh, using uh, that media, uh, combining it very creatively with, with other, other media. Um, so how does the poetics of your work combine uh, with the structures and the rigor of hard sciences and, and uh, scientific research? Um, well, painting is my oxygen. It's, it's where I get, it's a starting point of everything that I do. Um, so uh, I work very intuitively on painting. It's the very practice of painting keeps me very grounded in that notion of just switching off my brain or trying to apply meaning to things um, and to get out of the way and let the work come through. Um, the other part of what I do works with a, a different part of the brain and the sensory capacity. When I, I work conceptually, it's a different set of um, skills and a different ways of looking at the world. So um, yes, I've, I've, I'm working with and have worked with some of the really incredible scientists, historians, craftspeople, architects, you know, lighting artists, and um, every each discipline requires a different conversation. Um, I've, I've so much respect for the rigor of science and it's a sharing of ideas when we come together. It's, it's really a sharing of knowledge. And there's a particular mindset in the scientific world, um, which you know is, is about proving something and making an hypothesis. And as soon as the earth shifts and change, that hypothesis has to shift and change with it. Um, and I enjoy the discourse. I, I am, I'm the least methodical scientific person you could ever imagine. But I think that's why uh, the symphony between what we do dovetails so well, because I find that a lot of scientists are, for instance, closet artists. So, um, but it's it's never really, uh, you know, I just do what I do and they would do what they do. And um, uh, so recent, more recently in the last decade, I've explored lots of different ways of making things from video to sound making, um, you know, to uh, installations on landscape. And, you know, I found that a, a lot of, I needed to, to explore different ways of making work because of some of the extraordinary fragile places where I end up, where uh, something needs to be made immediately or recorded. So, um, yeah, I, I find um, particularly now that the scientists that I'm working with on my current project, there's just such a rich conversation going on um, between different institutions in Europe. And I'm trying to manage that online because I can't go to, physically to these places, but they've been extremely generous. And uh, I feel very lucky and fortunate to be able to be working with these great people. And I'm sure that they are feeling uh, the same. <laughs> yeah. uh, many scientists say that these dialogues and, and that these encounters uh, are really eye-opening and also make them the scientists look they work from the different angles so I, I think there is this uh, reciprocity yeah. feel for both. Um, uh, this is the this image is uh, the forest that Ulla um, is describing this is where the project for Smear Forest is and I can't wait to go there it looks amazing. Um, okay Yes, I, I wanted to, to go um, to this historical uh, element in your work. Um, the history and, and uh, historical documents are also very present in your artwork, or you mix very nicely these, uh, these different uh, 
uh, in times and, and spaces. Uh, for example, you have used old photographic plates and uh, historical medical films. Um, so what is more in interesting for you, the future speculations or, or the, the past? Um, the, the most interesting uh, historical documents for me are contained inside the great archives of ICE. Uh, which isn't a physical historical building. It's it's actually the archives themselves. I, um, I I've been in the presence of them on several occasions, um, and I just find that the actual sheer presence and the physical contact between my body and the body of ice is so amazing because you're confronted with the an enormity of these archives and historical records because of course inside the ice as it melts is contained primordial waters which you can't record really they go back to the beginning of time and inside the pockets of ice are contained bubbles which hold sounds from different epochs so as they melt they're releasing it back into our present time so um so the deep time archives are, are that you find in the strata of the earth are the most interesting um, to me. But I, um, I uh, went to the, uh, um, that was an expedition to the Arctic in 2015. And while I was up um, in that part of the world, I, I did a residency in the National Library of Oslo. And I spent many, many um, weeks drawing and sketching the glass plate photography that came from a lot of the expeditions that went um, in search of the Northwest Passage. Some of them weren't successful, some of them were, and it informed a whole series of paintings and works that I did. Very often I went through a lot of the archives, I was allowed to use them, I would find part of a glass plate in one drawer and then the other one that matched it in the other drawer and I was able to piece these stories together um, but what I found so fascinating is that um, the because the glass plate photography were, were inside the cameras that, um, you know, sometimes ended up inside of glaciers because of time had just frozen over them. And as the glaciers melted, I popped these cameras and the glass plates were um, totally intact inside. So that's what I was making my drawings from for these paintings. And uh, they, they showed the kind of some of them, some of them were so distorted that you'd only get half a face or part of the impression of where you felt somebody was was standing. And um, I'm told that in a lot of the cases, the people would have perished and not survived, but their cameras did. So their bones were found close to the to the cameras. So um, yeah, that that's an example of how I I would use an archive. Um, but I also for me, it's about going to the place, it's being in the physical presence of, um, which we can't do at the moment. Um, but uh, the, ener the energy contained inside a piece of land is what I try to draw into uh, my work, you know, just the feeling of being there. And I, I think uh, it's very um, positive in a sense to, to uh, have these archives shown uh, now in, in our present again. Um, I mean, it's a different context that they were created for, but it's also with your work, if they, they get uh, mixed with uh, these new aspects. And, and I, I, I think the, the photographers of that time would be very happy to see this, <laughs> these images uh, after your interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, it's remarkable um, to think that you could perish, but the, the, a tiny imprint of you is left inside of a glacier. You know, yeah, we could go. Find it. Oh, and... Sorry, sorry, sorry. You don't have so much time left, so uh, it would be nice to hear a bit what um, what kind of work you are now doing, and and what is the future work like that you are planning. OK, well, I'm working on this fascinating project. This is just a screenshot. Apologies for the photography. Um, 
it's it's I'm working on a project called Studiotopia, which is part of Beaux Arts, um, which is a museum in Brussels. I've selected one of 13 artists from across Europe to respond to art in the Anthropocene. My project is called Lost Landscapes, and it's I'm looking at as the permafrost melts in, in the poles, it's releasing um, these gases um, that are potentially toxic for humanity. Um, uh, and also uh, I'm exploring the soil and how uh, the soil as permafrost is the intelligence inside the soil with the, the fungi and the, the kind of um, uh, the primal matter of fungi can kind of keep pockets of um, elements of seeds, etc. safe inside the world. So this is uh, part of the project. Also, I'm, I'm working with a a scientist in Vienna who has managed to germinate seeds that were 32,000 years old that were found in the Siberian Arctic. It's the oldest example in the world of um, uh, a plant being able to come back into our present time. Um, and it's just the most extraordinary, uh, beautiful, um, little delicate white flower. And to me, it's such a symbol of hope that you know, while we're in this emergency and we're looking at the facts of what is happening, um, that there are these messages contained underground. So at the moment, I'm, I'm working with a scientist in the um, European Commission and we're looking at soil samples. Um, there's a thousand soil samples that I'm hoping to explore <laughs> with him when I make it over there. Uh, I think he might be on this talk, but... Um, Anyway, so that's my current work at the moment. That will be going on a touring show next year, starting in Bazaar and going around Europe with, uh, with this, this exhibition. Thanks for showing this, <laughs> this plan. It's incredible. I know. Don't. <laughs> um, so um, going back as still to these uh, expeditioners, um, I think we both are fascinated with these, <laughs> these people. And uh, I, was, uh, I was curious to know if you could name one, uh, an expeditioner oh. um, and from history um, that you could, um, you would like to participate with this, this journey, if possible. Well, there's so many, but one that comes to mind actually will help me explain the last piece of work for the show. Um, it was an expedition called Southern Cross and it was in 1859, it was in Boston, and it, it uh, happened to go into uncharted territory and um, a huge storm happened and ended up experiencing one of the, the most famous uh, solar storm that happened has ever happened on Earth. So it was called uh, the Carrington Event and uh, the Aurora Borealis had appeared all over the world and it was, uh, it happened for one week and telecommunications completely stopped in the world as well. And um, I've called an artwork, um, The Week the Sun Touched the Earth in response to, to it and many other things. The artwork is a collaboration with uh, DIA Safe commissioned this, the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies. And uh, it's in response to Solar Orbiter, which is a spacecraft that took off uh, last year to go to the sun and um, I, I'm making a short film projection that um, that looks at how Irish people perceived the sun going back in the Irish annals to you know as far back as 700 AD and right up into the present and how people uh, experience the aurora borealis. So I'm working, I was working with a dancer, uh, I'm uh, yeah, a very dear friend of mine who has recently passed away, um, very tragically. So her movement is depicted in, in the film where she embodies um, the movement of the sun across the equator as, as a double virtual um, sort of visual experience. And uh, she literally embodies light. So it's, it's um, yeah, it's a very uh, deeply uh, resonant, emotional artwork for me at this point because uh, I've seen it through the lens of, of my friendship with this wonderful human being. So it also looks at the idea of continuum and how the earth cycles keep continuing. 
So this is part of the spacecraft and some of the materials that I'm using, which is um, bone matter, that black, uh, that black surface is actually carbon and charred bone. And this last image, which is just a screenshot, um, one of the most interesting things that's on board is a Stix camera and it's got this grid in front of it. So these lenses are projecting images back um, to Earth from the sun every second that's picked up in NASA, but it's projecting it through these grids. And these are moray patterns that are similar to 1920s photography. So the information comes as data and it's split through these gorgeous little squares, if you can see them. And um, so a lot of the image making is um, that I, it incorporates some of the, uh, uh, the mathematical structures in, in the data. So I'm looking forward, I'm gonna be showing that at Ula Ulan um, soon, and then it goes to Centre Culture Irlandes and then possibly to some other places. Okay, that sounds, so it's it's going to be a, a film? Or... Yeah, it's a, it's a film, but it will be projected through um, an old telescope. So what I'm hoping is that, um, uh, you know, after the lockdown, when I can show it in a gallery space that, you know, yeah. one will come enter into a space and find some scientific apparatus or a hole in the wall or something quite small that you're urged to look through. Mm -hmm. um, and then you look through and this inc incredible display of Aurora Borealis and this journey around the sun happens. So you're transported into this sort of dreamlike experience and um, through the movement of dance. I, I didn't know about this Aurora Borealis expedition, so I have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, um, and I think we we don't have much more time. Shall we take some questions now? Uh, yes. So if um, if anybody would like to ask a question, um, maybe put it in the chat. It's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, there are some questions there already. Um, Diane wants to know where your video work can online can be found, Siobhan. Through your website, I presume? Which video work? Uh, just your video work generally, I would say. Oh, um, I just, I just uh, have excerpts of the video works on the website under videos. Um, uh, yeah. And under YouTube, I'm on YouTube as well. Okay. okay. Uh, do you have your own YouTube channel, Siobhan? Yeah. Or yeah, okay. So yeah. that's where we can find it. Yeah. Um, and then there was a question about who the scientist's name who is growing from ancient seeds. The scientist's name. Mm. Well, there's there's a number of scientists. They're, they're originally um, germinated in Russia. Um, but the scientist I'm working with is Margaret, Margaret Lahmer, and she is in uh, Vienna, and she is, I, I'm doing experiments with soil, um, with plant cultures, and looking at how um, the plant is able to regrow itself. So her name is Margaret Lahmer. Okay, you're fading a little bit there, Siobhan, again, maybe. Is it, yeah, so it's Margaret Muller, is it? Yeah. Lammer. Lam Lamber. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's another question. Would like to have access to that imprint of butterflies, the natural photogram. Is that anywhere? Um, it's it's in Illin Galleries at the moment. <laughs> um, so, but not open to the public. So. Um, it's on my website, and it's on the website yeah. for the show. Isn't it? Yeah. 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 Um, and then, yes, we're recording the conversation, so I'm hoping we'll be able to put it up on our, our that it'll come out okay, and uh, that we'll be able to put it up on our U YouTube channel and our website as well. So, um, yeah, it will be available after this. Um, do there's other questions? Okay. 
Um, I have a question, Siobhan, just on your collaboration with scientists. Um, do, how do you get how do you get in touch with people initially? Do you you must have a quite a network of of people now that you've been working with over the past while. Um, is it through that kind of network that you might hear of scientists who are engaging in work that you're also interested in? Um, well, I think the uh, initially uh, it started when the very famous volcano erupted in Iceland and I, I just got myself straight on a flight back in 2010 and I happened to be traveling with geologists and that's kicked off my whole relationship with scientists because I just made friends with them and then I ended up on this brilliant residency in University College Dublin um, um, and I, I was able to travel between all the different floors and talk to different scientists so my advice to anybody who wants to reach out to a scientist is to uh, get involved is, is just to to write to them, uh, that's what I do. I, um, I send email or I try to contact them. And, you know, I, I often just treat it like as if you're trying to make a new friend with somebody, you know, don't bombard them and just maybe just send out a message. And if you don't get anything back, just leave it at that. You know, sometimes it takes a lot of, you know, a lot of time for somebody to come back. For instance, I sent a message to Margaret six weeks before she replied and I was so and she didn't reply because I thought, oh, I'm not going to be able to use this plant in this project. But, um, so I do have a network now, but it, it, I, I think people are very open to collaboration um, uh, and, and ways of um, exploring the climate and the earth at the moment. So, mm -hmm. yeah, if I can help in any way, if, if it's another question you want to ask me about how to for artists to reach out to scientists is that what you mean Anne? no it's just more that um i suppose how you come across people that are working in very interesting ways like that scientist is who's growing seed from um from ancient or growing plants from ancient seeds you know I that yeah. How you hear about people who are doing these really interesting things? I read all the time. I'm always searching, I'm always questioning. I, I have lots and lots of books that are usually about contemporary matters in you know, art and environment. Uh, I go to lots of exhibitions when we can. And uh, I just have a very curious mind. I'm constantly downloading everything everywhere I go. So, um, it's a very natural process. I just come across things. And actually, I think that's where my intuition kicks in. I, there's never, I just get out of the way. I, I have an idea and I point myself in that direction. And then very often things start to come to me. Uh, I try very much not to control any of it. And uh, mm. you know, synchronicity, a lot of these things happen. It's amazing yeah. times. Okay, yeah, I think that's that's a trait that both artists and scientists share is curiosity. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, just Great that, yeah. The trouble. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a question here to ask about the way the artist sees this going beyond academics and artists like all the people around the screen here. Um, so can you ask me that again, please? Yeah, I'm not really sure. Um, Ramon, um, maybe you'd like to ask that question yourself because I'm not quite sure if I'm understanding yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's pretty simple. I mean, I, I like this a lot. There's lots of interesting ideas coming up. But but the, the, the point is, how is this kind of working in the current context beyond the nice group of people who are sitting around here? I mean, how, how is this useful for, for, for society, for people, for other cultures, for, to try to understand and make sense of the world we're living in and the problems we're facing? I mean, it's obviously an interesting endeavor, but how does this hook up 
with with what's going on. I mean, I'm sure that there's some sort of ideas about that beyond the fact of making exhibitions and writing papers, which we all like, and uh, it's a useful way to start. But but in the end, it needs to be something else going on or some sort of further intention in the same way that when you say that sediments track history, what is our understanding of the future? I mean, what are we trying to seed? What we are seeding is essentially nuclear waste and plastics and stuff. But there's also some sort of ideas that we might be putting forward. And that's what I'm kind to trying to see what uh, the artist uh, on the spot here has <laughs> ideas about. <laughs> What, where, where are we going with this work? Thank you. Thanks, that's an interesting question. I've got many questions. I'll try and answer it. Um, I think that one of the most powerful things that uh, people can do is to come together as a community, to commune on ideas across disciplines. In, uh, historically, it's, it's how change has been made. People kind of come together and um, art, uh, has a wonderful capacity to go beyond processes of science or information and data and actually to engage in the subliminal uh, parts of the human consciousness and to affect thinking. And, and from there, um, you know, all change starts with inside somebody, with inside yourself. And then from that, um, it uh, ripples out in ways that we can't even understand. It ripples out into other people, into communities. So as the change is made inside of our own, uh, in, inside of our own cells, and as we are intrigued by what's going on in the earth, and not really necessarily about, you know, thinking about necessarily what you physically do. I think the fact that you're even thinking about it or having this conversation, or you're really even on this debate at the moment, is planting a seed of some sort and it has an extraordinary you can't um uh even imagine the capacity of, of uh, power of change we have inside of inside of ourselves so i think that um it has everything to do with this and um, you know the process of me going somewhere in the middle of nowhere standing there with a sketchbook you can't think what am i doing to to help the situation. And I, I believe that projects that I make, I don't know where they go to, but if, if in any way they help to bring some focus on to waking us up, um, I, I would be deeply honored, you know. I hope that answers the question part of it. I'm, I'm bringing closer as if you want yeah. to Yeah. Does that help? Does that, does that answer it? I, I'm not sure you're, of your name, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Are you there? I don't hear you anymore, Ramon. You I muted. Ra Ramon Guadans. I mean, a good friend of Ula from the last 30 years or something. Oh, good. <laughs> it's a voice from Madrid. I just wanted to add here that I, I think uh, work uh, such as uh, the work of Siphon, uh, we can understand her work without reading of all these scientific collaborations and and there is the artist uh, the power and uh, the beauty and 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 uh, the aesthetics is there and uh, this is something that very often um comes uh, when when artists uh work with scientific topics that you have to read a paper before you see what is in this this artwork but i see uh Siphon's work very powerful because uh, you get something just seeing it and it's it's the power of the art but then it also has the other narratives um, that are the stories behind her, her work and the other thing that I wanted to I, I don't know why you are asking so much of the, the, the usefulness um, I mean, everything doesn't have to be directly useful, uh, and arts especially not. Uh, this this kind of um, oh, did I understand you wrong? 
I, I, I'm not. I'm not saying things need to be useful. I need. Oh, things. I understood you wrong. Sorry. Sorry. No, I, things I need to be in, integrated. I mean, we're living in a world. We're not okay. just a bunch of nice, white-looking academics. Oh, we're, okay. we're, Sorry. And how, how do we talk to the rest of the world who's not around this table? I mean, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it's not not being useful. Is being friendly, being kind, and being aware that that we're not alone or on top of this. I think you don't underestimate the power of a change inside. You know, inside of everything you do and every everything, every conversation you have, it's um, it ripples out. So my work tends to be very quiet and very subtle, and um, it doesn't. It's not roaring and shouting it's very subtle so um i i like to kind of bring the focus into kind of matters uh inside the earth and and therefore inside the human psyche as well um, and to go beyond um to, to go beyond the limits of kind of communication and trying to affect sort of the subliminal elements of how we interact with the world there was something else also, uh, I think, in, in your work, um, all this data and, and uh, climate change uh, related um, communication. And so I, I see your works and, and I see the trees, I see the uh, ashes from the volcano or, or something. And, and I think it can be very inspiring for people um, just to do their own explorations in in the in the near forest, or everybody can't go to the volcano. But but I, I think this is a powerful tool in a sense to to, to sensitize uh, people's mind to to be uh, and, and understand what is the value of the of the natural medium. Okay, um, there's, we'll take, there's one final question uh, from Michal who says, um, is there also a value in agnostic approaches to discussion, that there's value in differences of opinion, um, that too much consensus, say, between artists and scientists can be oppressive. So it's, there's a value in difference and differences of opinion in debate and disagreement. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, absolutely, we all have to have an independent mind and we have to question everything. And um, it's one of the greatest joys of being an artist is that you, you can question everything in, in a different mm. way. You have artistic license to pose questions uh, mm. that aren't necessarily uh, written down, but they, they may putting two things together in a different situation or placing two things beside each other, a conversation emerges either in a gallery or in an artwork. And um, very often I, I take things from gaps in history um, or something I might find you know, in the natural world and I place it um, you know, in juxtaposition to something else. And so I think it's, it's extremely important now to ask questions and to wake themselves up because God knows we've been asleep and, and we're, we're in a, a crisis um, bigger than humanity has ever experienced. In, in 15 years, we've managed to undo 50 million years of evolution. Mm. You know, and that seed was 32,000 years old uh, and it was lying dormant, very quiet inside the earth, protected by the sorrow sleeping almost, you know, and the earth has the, has the ability, the choir in my work at the moment is looking at the forces inside of the earth that held that secret, that, um, you know, that uh, time machine intact to come out at a time now um, when we're, we're, we've undone nature almost, and yet the ability of a seed to be in dormancy um, through certain processes brings up a whole set of questions mm. and um, about permanence and about control and about scientific control and how we as humans feel that 
you know, uh, we're the most important thing on the earth and we're not actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we just, um, we've nearly destroyed it from what I can see. So I hope that answers your question. Hmm. Yes, thank you very much. I think um, maybe we'll we leave it there. We're gone. We're gone over the hour. Um, just want to thank you very much, Ula and Siobhan, um, for this conversation and for this insight into your work, Siobhan. Um, we love having your work in the galleries. We'd love to be able to share it physically, but um, we hope that what we are sharing online gives people whets people's appetite to find out more about your work um, I'll circulate any links and so on to the participants here that they can follow to find out more about the work and more about uh, Ula's work as well um, so I'll just say thank you everybody